Hi everyone, on today's episode on Through Your Eyes, we have Kieran Mishra, who's gonna talk a little bit about her journey um, leading up to being a professor at Edinburgh and how she uses her experiences to kind of shape who she is today. So thank you so much for taking time out your day to be here today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure, Rana. Uh, if I can make a difference on other women, other girls who are out there, it will be an absolute delight. So tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're from and what you do. I was born in India. Um, when I was six years old, my dad moved to the Philippines. At the age of 28, he was offered an international job where he was uh, an entomologist for a philanthropical organization called the International Rice Research Institute, started by Rockefeller and Ford. And their aim was to be the center for rice research for the whole world. This is when there was a lot of poverty. A lot of countries couldn't uh, produce enough rice to feed their population. So this 28-year-old became the entomologist for the department. Mm -hmm. uh, when we moved there, I was six. I have two sisters. They were one and two. My mother didn't speak any English. So for her to go from India to a place where she had to deal with a new culture, uh, deal with household help who couldn't communicate with her because they didn't know our language, she didn't know English. It was pretty challenging, but it was also very exciting. Mm -hmm. So we went to the local elementary school where I um, picked up the local language, Tagalog. So mm -hmm. I learned to speak Tagalog, made a lot of friends. It was a really, really nice uh, experience for me. And mm -hmm. then my dad became director of um, research for the entire world, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so every time rice would be produced, a new variety would be produced, we would get it at home, we would try it out. So we were like the guinea pigs, we were oh. the samplers. It was really nice. And um, just watching my dad getting involved in research, being an entomologist, doing his lab research and all that, sort of motivated me to go into the sciences uh, to try and help the population in one way or the other. And um, believe it or not, I did my degree in plant breeding. So not entomology, but plant breeding, and then uh, minored in plant pathology. So more or less along the lines of what my dad did. He was one of the uh, researchers that produced miracle rice. Mm -hmm. So he was part of the green revolution. Mm -hmm. I will never be something like that, but I did come up with a corn variety, sweet corn variety, a gene that gives resistance to uh, a virus that gene is now found in every single sweet corn grown in the United States. Oh, so awesome. I did sort of leave something behind. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And so how'd you end up here in the you know, Erie, Edinburgh area? Um, when I finished my high school in the Philippines, in Manila, my dad wanted me to go back to India to do my college, sort of get a cultural experience of what India was like. You know, when you leave when you're six, you really don't know the culture right. as much. And we used to go back every summer, visit our relatives, but how much do you imbibe in you know, a couple of weeks? Mm -hmm. So he said, you wanna go back to India, get your degree there, I went there, I hated it. Really. Um, we didn't have any family in Delhi, so New Delhi was uh, where I went, the University of New Delhi. I mm -hmm. went there. Uh, during holidays, kids would go home and I would be stuck in the dorm, mm -hmm. so I didn't like it. The best experience I had was I joined the tennis team. As a freshman, I became captain of my team. Mm -hmm. We traveled all over India, played tennis, represented our university, Delhi University. We reached the finals. So as a freshman, to be in the finals for the entire country was awesome. Mm -hmm. We lost to a university that had professionals registered as students. Wow. So that really sucked, otherwise we would have won. <laughs> so that was a phenomenal experience. But I didn't like it, I was very homesick. Went back to uh, the Philippines, finished my undergrad, then got admission at Cornell University. So mm -hmm. my husband and I, we got married just before we came to uh, the States got my degree there. So it was, in a way, it was like destiny that I yeah. sort of had to go to Cornell. We went to Cornell, my dad had a sabbatical in Cornell in uh, 1969, the mm -hmm. year Apollo almost didn't come back from the moon, mm -hmm. so Apollo 13. <laughs> so uh, I did my seventh grade over there and I thought, you know what? 
uh, it's not a bad place, and I'm going to see if I can get admission as a grad student. Who knew? Yeah. So I did get admission there. It was really nice. How did it lead you to? So from when we graduated from Cornell, my husband and I, we moved to Jamestown, New York, where I was teaching Mm -hmm. part-time. It worked out well because I had two small kids, so my husband would watch them at night, and I would teach evening classes. Then he got a job in Erie. And when he got a job in Erie, I applied at Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And it just worked out. And it's perfect. You know, initially... Uh, I thought that I would go into research, follow my dad's line. But when I taught in Jamestown, at Jamestown Community College, I loved it. And I said, Mm -hmm. you know what? Research is not my destiny. Teaching is my destiny. Mm -hmm. And I just look forward to it all the time. Mm -hmm. So how was your experience? You know, obviously you came here, you know, from an entirely different country. And uh, as an Indian woman in the United States, like, especially at Edinburgh, like, uh, where it's majority white, how was that your, How was that experience for you? It was very, very interesting. When I first joined, I joined as an adjunct faculty uh, and then became a tenure track position. So when I first joined, uh, the, do- the department was dominantly male white. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really appreciate having me in the department. I got the job that one of the faculty members' wives should have gotten. Mm-hmm. But when there was a vote as whom to pick, the majority of the department picked me. So he was pretty upset with me and gave me the cold shoulder throughout until he retired. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some experiences where most of my classes were eight o'clock classes. They knew full well that I had two little kids that I had to drop at the bus stop or take to school, but they wanted to give me a hard time. They wanted me to leave and mm-hmm. go somewhere else. And I said, you know what, I need this job. I need uh, to show my kids that women can do anything that men can do. So I just um, did what I had to do and just ignored people who made life a little bit tough. After uh, a little while, uh, in one of my classes, one of my students came up to me and said, you know, Dr. Mishra, I didn't want to say this to you initially, but my advisor or his advisor told him not to take my class. Now, this was a time when we had catalogs, so the internet things weren't online. So his advisor looked up my class, saw the name, and he said, do not take this professor. You will not understand his accent. Mm -hmm. You will not understand anything in class. So this advisor didn't know anything about me. First of all, he didn't know I was a female. Mm -hmm. He'd never met me. He made a judgment call based on my name. And the student said that, he so appreciates that he took my class because he's learned a lot and my English is way far better than his advisors. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, That's you know, awesome. judgment calls, people shouldn't be doing that. Just because your name is a little different doesn't mean that you're any less than they are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And there was once a time where I was struggling and I reached out to you and, you know, you shared a story with me and I think it's really powerful and I'd for sure love for you to share that too. Sure. Um, Periodically, we would have department meetings, and this is the time when the department was predominantly white male. So we were sitting at the table, and two of us had been hired at the same time. One was a white male and myself. So this senior faculty member, he must have been in his late 50s at that time, knew Mm -hmm. that one of us was from Cornell. And he couldn't even fathom that a female from India could have a PhD from Cornell. So he leaned over me and talked to this other professor and said, so you're the Cornellian. And he just looked at the professor and said, nope, that was it. And that sent a very powerful message. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember when he told me that, it just, it blew me away and it's kind of exactly what I needed to hear at that time. So thank you for that at that time. Um, But tell me a little bit more, you know, about your family, You know, you talk a lot about your dad. What about your mom, you know, your siblings? My mom um, was educated only till the ninth grade. So in India, during her time, it wasn't um, looked upon to educate daughters because you're wasting money because what are they going to do? They're going to get married and have kids and start a family. So put all your energy into the sons and educate Mm -hmm. them. So she came from that background because that was the common belief at that time. When she married my dad, she was only 16. At 19, she had me. Mm -hmm. 
and then she had my two other uh, sisters. When she moved to the Philippines, um, the director of the institute would come home every day and teach her English, which was phenomenal. She was a really nice uh, person, and I would sit down and I would also imbibe the language. So even though I had gone to kindergarten before we moved to the Philippines, it's not the same as living in a country where everyone around you is speaking English. So I was able to pick up the language. My mom was so phenomenal that everyone in the, um, in the housing area where we lived um, appreciated her so much. She would have afternoon teas where people would come in. At the age of 40, she picked up painting, Chinese painting, wow. and she made such phenomenal paintings. So she adjusted so well. And my dad had a very open mindset. He said, people would ask him, aren't you sad that you don't have a son? And he would say, no, my daughters are better than sons. And my daughters will achieve whatever a son can achieve. He always pushed education. He always treated us equally uh, to any other uh, males around. And he made sure that we got the best education possible. Mm -hmm. He pushed sports, yes, but the one thing that I still don't appreciate what my dad did was I wanted to play tennis. So tennis was my heart and soul. When I was in India and I was playing for the University of uh, Delhi University, there was a coach who saw me and he said that he wanted to train me professionally. And he said I had all the potential for playing professional tennis. And I was so thrilled, Rana. You won't believe how thrilled I was. So I told my dad, uh, I want to play professional tennis. I don't want to go to college. I want to push college off for a while. Now, this is where the father Indian mentality comes in. It's like, well, what are you going to do with tennis? What career will you have? What happens if you have an injury? Then what are you going to do? Mm. So, you know, you could get it that way. I thought, well, let me go to Cornell. Let me get my degree and maybe play tennis at the same time. But I had my first son when I was a grad student. So initially at the beginning, I had him. And then I had my second son when I was uh, writing my thesis. So two kids as a grad student was wow. very challenging. But when I got the job at Edinburgh, I played tennis here. And wow. I played tennis at uh, Penbriar uh, Tennis Club. I played City Rec. I became champion of City Rec several times. Mm -hmm. There's a really funny story that you'll appreciate. So I had um, a tournament where I was playing and my opponent was a middle school student and I was already in my mid thirties. So mm -hmm. we were in the finals, okay? So this, what, 13 year old and this 35 year old in a final. Our match lasted three hours. Oh. And in the end, I beat her. <laughs> Let's go. And it's like, <laughs> I finally won. But the next day, I couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of experiences. Yeah. My kids also followed tennis. So children follow what their parents do. And I think with first generation immigrants, we want our kids to focus on education. But at the same time, we don't want to deprive them of other opportunities like sports, yeah. like you do. So they tried all different kinds of sports. They stayed away from tennis because that's what their mom played, <laughs> right? But eventually they came and they played tennis. They liked tennis mm -hmm. and they were both um, involved in the McDowell tennis team. But with college being so um, rigorous, they couldn't um, keep up right. with their tennis afterwards. But yeah, all rounders. Yes, yeah, so, and like not even with kids though. I feel like you're in a position now where you have you know women, a lot of women who come through your classes, even men. How do you feel like you use your platform as a teacher, or professor, uh, to kind of use all your experiences to influence these kids beyond just you know the content in your classes? So I'll I'll give you an example of a student who um, is very close to my heart. And this was about 15 years back when I was teaching. Um, an African-American student in my uh, principles of biology class, um, he was very shy, very quiet, would not really talk to anyone. And the first exam that we have, he aced it. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, just like I ask students in my class, can I announce your name that you did so well in class? And he said, sure. Uh, the second exam, he also aced it. So he was a non-declared student. And I called him uh, to my office and I said, 
what what do you want to major in you've put non de- non uh, no majors undeclared and he said you know when he was in high school his high school teacher said you will amount to nothing you're good for nothing you're not very intelligent don't even bother going to college okay so when i spoke to him i said ignore all that's happened in the past you're such an exceptional student you're such a brilliant person what do you want to do and he said he wanted to go into medicine i said go to the registrar's office right now tell them that you want to be pre-med major uh, so he went he filled out the form got an a the best grade in class and then next semester he came up to see me in my office and he said dr mishra i hope you won't be mad but is it okay if i switch to a chem major because they're going to give me a full scholarship and i told him by all means become a chem major it really doesn't matter what your major is as long as you just take the chemistries the biology the physics for yeah. med school he went to med school that's awesome he went to cleveland he is a professor he is a professor as well as a medical doctor at the cleveland clinic oh So every time he goes home to visit his parents he always stops by my office. That's awesome. So what's right? Well, it's awesome. <laughs> He's such awesome. a phenomenal person. So he had so much going against him. He came from a very poor background. He was African American. He had no support from his teachers in high school. His parents didn't have the financial means. So everything working against him. That's when you need to step in as a professor and realize, you know, this there's so much potential in this person you need to support them so much yeah. and it really touches your heart when they appreciate it yeah. and they remember yeah. you so yeah that's unbelievable yes. that's really and nice. that's all it takes is one person to tell you you can exactly yeah and then thankfully you had your dad and your parents and your right. support system to kind of tell you all the time what you can do so to close it off i usually ask people you know people who you most love and in this case it's your you know you talked about your dad your mom your siblings you know if they were all sitting in this room right now You know, what's the one thing? What are a few things that you'd want to tell them and let them know? I want to add my husband into that okay. situation scenario can, too. Can, uh, yeah, because when uh, as a grad student when I was doing research, my research was on corn, so I was in the corn fields all the time. Mm-hmm. My husband took care of my firstborn. Um whenever I had to put up my promotion packages to get promoted, which is another story where there were a lot of hurdles, he helped me prepare my promotion packages. Mm-hmm. He would take the kids to the daycare. He would do whatever he could to support me. So without his support, yes, my parents early on in life, my husband later on in life. So what I want to tell my parents, my kids as well, they were very supportive. Uh, my husband is that I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have their backing. When things got tough, they were the ones who pushed me, and I am what I am today because of them.